All right, well, um, well, welcome everyone to the uh, last uh, installation in 2020 of NB Heart Center CV Weekly Rounds. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a, needless to say, a year to remember and a year unlike any other that we have experienced probably in our lifetime, unless you were alive for the Spanish flu. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a neat opportunity uh, to take a few minutes and kind of reflect on the on the recent year. We've had a, we've had a, good set of rounds that were inspired honestly by the pandemic and the uh, the onslaught of Zoom meetings. And uh, we were able to put together a, a nice series, I thought, and we will continue this on the 13th of January. Um, but kind of in the spirit of a, a little bit of reflection, a little bit of lightheartedness um, and some poignancy, um, I thought it would be a nice uh, opportunity if uh, we kind of just take this uh, next session to, to kind of look back and look forward all at the same time. So. I'd like to thank JF in advance for having uh, put the effort into putting this together. And uh, Jeff, I'll let you take it away. Uh, thank you, Ansar. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity. I agree with you. It's one of these years that uh, you reflect quite a bit on things and, uh, and hopefully I'll, I'll satisfy those things. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a little bit how I felt with this year. You know, I'm, I'm riding a ridge and, uh, you know, a precipice on either side. Uh, so I just par paraphrase this, but these are going to be my perspective today. Uh, I'll try to touch on a few major events that I think have, have been in incredibly uh, marking to us this year. Obviously, COVID-19 is a big story, but I don't want it all to be about that. Uh, the impact on the NB NBHC and uh, wishes for the new year. And uh, that's not me biking, obviously. Uh, that'd be terrible. Um, so, you know, I, how did it start this year? You probably all remember yourselves. Um, I started in Quebec visiting my family and my parents uh, around New Year's time. And, you know, as a, as a thing of typical of this year, I haven't seen them since. So uh, I'm sure there's a longing for many of you for not having seen your family for almost a year now. Um, in January 8th, we already were facing uh, an incredible disaster that affected obviously Iran and many people around the world. This was the Ukraine International Airlines flight. It seems that already a century ago uh, where 63 Canadians lost their lives on that day. Um, after that was, you know, we all went or some of us went to March break and then within March break on March 11th, even if we were seeing these things happening in slow motion around us in the US or across the world in China, you know, we, we all knew there was something going on, but, you know, it became, you know, close to home and close to everybody in 2020 when uh, the WHO announced that this was a pandemic. That was on March 11th. Uh, and this is the kind of things now you go to. These are the incredible resources you can find online. Uh, this is the best one that I know of, the John Hopkins uh, essentially COVID uh, dashboard. This is just from a few days ago, and we're nearly approaching the 2 million deaths worldwide. Uh, from this pandemic. So this is real. This is affecting our lives and affecting all of us. Um, and, you know, I saw things this year that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. Perhaps uh, crazy conspiracies are part of regular life. People believe them and they're sticking to them. Uh, there's humongous denial of, of a pandemic that's around us that seems obvious to all of us working in healthcare, but it's clearly not obvious to many. Uh, and this incredible anti-science movement and uh, and where all of us or everybody's become an expert and this is the covid version of the pyramid of of uh, evidence as you can see here the first at the top normally would be an rct well it's rct is pending uh peer reviewed but only 10 minutes uh collection of opinions level three some opinion level four and opinion is level five evidence uh, and this is what we see now it's pretty amazing um, and but as we are today on Zoom, this is a great photo of, of my colleague. There's Ansar, there's Christine Herman, there's Rakesh Arora, and there's Morale Zunia. And we're all uh, previous Halifax grad, all getting together for uh, a particular event at the C CSCS. Uh, so these are things that we would have never done like this together before, but this all done virtually. And you can see here the stock market value of Zoom as it's gone up from before the pandemic, it's, uh, you know, a 300% increase. It's pretty amazing. So Zoom is part of our lives and we use it all the time and, and hopefully we make the best of it most of the time. Um, how could we forget that on, in April, we also had uh, an incredible or a terrible massacre in Nova Scotia that is just next to us. 
uh, where 22 people lost their lives. You know, I have a, I had a cottage in Wentworth right next to where some of these things had that I sold last year just before all of this. Um, and what about you know the murder of George Floyd uh, and 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 the incredible uh, movement after that, where Black Lives Matter movement uh, and this is just a picture in the U.S. of all of the protests and demonstrations that have occurred. This is in August, uh, just a representation of how throughout the United States there's certainly a recognition. I did not have one for Canada, but the same thing in Canada. These are all, you know, events that would mark normally as a single event for an entire year that now there, these are multitudes of these events over the entire year. Uh, and finally in August, uh, what about the Beirut, Beirut explosion? Again, these terrible disaster, Halifax explosion is around, you know, the size of it, three kiloton. Uh, this uh, in Beirut was essentially about a third of that 1.3 uh, kiloton. So it gives you an idea of the magnitude. And we talked about the Halifax explosion being as one of the largest man-man explosion man-made sorry, explosion, obviously of non-nuclear uh, origin, uh, and uh, the Beirut explosion as approaches that. This is an incredible disaster. Uh, and how can we not think about the U.S. elections um, and, uh, and the total cost of these elections that have surpassed two to three-fold what every single previous election in U.S. history how we spend billions of dollars, this $13 billion essentially spent on an election. Uh, and, uh, and, and these are things that I, I just, I can't, I have a hard time imagining. And uh, obviously we're talking about recounting for those of you who see the, uh, the analogy here to Monty Python. Um, and thankful to be in the Atlantic bubble. I think the Atlantic bubble for us, you know, people are jealous, they're jealous of us and I'm proud to be here. I feel that, you know, uh, a little bit protected from the rest of the world somehow, and uh, and I feel very very lucky of of all those things. Um, but what about the NBHC? So I've given you my sort of perspective of the year. This was a, a pretty sad year in many ways, uh, and a year that I'm sure we we're not going to forget. But throughout all of this, at the NBHC, uh, despite uh, as you can see here in the graph, we had a dip obviously in productivity or the cases we were able to do during the, the initial phase of pandemic, we've continued to do uh, essentially back to normal and actually catching up on some of that, that case volume. We actually had a deficit of about 66 cases during the pandemic that we predict. And, and we're predicting by the end of, of December 31st, we'll be around 890 cases completed. We'd uh, essentially done 9 to 16 last year. So we essentially almost caught up completely what, what we'd lost during the pandemic time. Just really highlighting the efforts from everybody in terms of catching up and doing as much work as possible to really address, obviously, the patient need that has not gone away throughout all of this. Uh, and this is really important. And, you know, it's tremendous accomplishment. And this is just a graph of looking at the cardiac surgical volume at the NBHC that has gone steadily gone up from the 1990s to, to 2019. And obviously a slight drop here in 2020 related to the pandemic. But we would normally have been at around 950 cases if we hadn't lost those 66 cases, uh, which, is, which is, again, a, a testament to a, everyone's effort with all of this. Uh, and I can't avoid making this comparison or showing comparison to our neighboring province. Hopefully there's not too many listening on this uh, Zoom uh, uh, thing this morning, but you know, the predicted comparison between those two centers is the NBHC here in this column, our surgical volume approaching 900. That includes TAVI. Halifax 968 is the predicted for this year. That's including also their TAVI. You know, number of surgeons here, we're uh, nearly half of them. We have no house staff or fellows. We do about essentially the same amount of ECMO cases. We have a, less than half the ICU beds, less than a third of the step-down beds, and nearly half of the OR resources that they have. Uh, so it's a testament essentially of how efficient and how hard people are working to achieve all the things that we do. And this is an important reflection that we should all have and be proud of. Um, you know, this year has been also the first year that we had a code shock protocol and, you know, we've launched this in November or December of last year. This is our first year that we've lived through this, uh, the good, the bad, the, and, and we're about at a stage now to review our first hundred patients and we've gotten REB approval to review them. 
And this is really important because we want to know what we've done well, what we've done poorly, where we can improve, where we can change things. Uh, you know, this is something that took two years to get to this point, and we're here now to sort of improve and keep moving along that. Um, you know, Dr. White's first year with us. Sorry, Chris, I had to take this picture from a, it's, it's courtesy of Juliana that shared this with me. Uh, anyways, hopefully you like. Uh, and he spent his first year with us, and it's been amazing to have him here. He's really elevated our game, particularly with uh, as a team in acute mechanical support. This is here, the team, this Chris in CCU, putting a patient on ECMO in CCU itself and with our OR team there and me helping him. Uh, and now we've done CC obviously ECMO initiated in the emergency department with survivors and people we've managed to get home from this. Same for this particular patient in CCU over a few days was able to be the, transferred back to CCU and good heart failure management and recovered. Uh, and now we've done in SICU also a patient awake this time, uh, put on ECMO for life-saving uh, therapy. You know, we are saving lives, and these are patients that would not have lived normally in the past. Not that we're not capable, but we're just able to do things just a little bit better and bringing some expertise. And how can we not talk about the resilience and the adapt adapt adaptability of the of the New Brunswick Heart Center. Here's us with a virtual Christmas Zoom. Uh, I, I know it sounds awkward to do, but it was actually quite a bit of fun uh, to, to have some trivia, some trivia games, and some, some prizes to be given. Uh, and, you know, maybe these are some things to learn for years to come or for events to come. These are not perfect things, but they are certainly allowing us to to sort of thank each other for all the work we do and, and, and acknowledge our efforts. Uh, so clearly there's some positives to 2020 uh, and the pandemic, and hopefully I've highlighted a few of those things, including you know the Zoom that we're on today. Uh, the only weird thing about the Zoom, I must say, is I feel like I'm talking alone in a vacuum on a screen, uh, and I have no feedback from any of you. This is the hardest thing in the world. But other than that, it is, it is amazing the reach that we have. Great job. Um, Mark, great job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly what I needed. Uh, and uh, but if you think about it, I mean, imagine you know we started the year with this virus sort of happening across the world in different places. We realized and sort of named this a pandemic in March, and from then we've managed to create a vaccine that now is being rolled out, and already uh, you know seventeen or eighteen hundred New Brunswickers have received this vaccine. Our frontline workers and uh, and hopefully our most vulnerable are the ones getting this first. Uh, I mean, this is an incredible feat of science and I feel very uh, grateful that this is possible and all of us are seeing some hope with this. And I would certainly encourage you to, 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 to and I'm sure you are looking forward to potentially putting this behind us. Um, you know, the NBHC it, uh, has, has had tremendous uh, things this year, but mostly, you know, I started 2020, as you see there, it would be the year I got everything I wanted. But in reality, now is the year that I appreciate everything I have. Uh, and I am very thankful for the things I have and, and, and the home I live and the place I live and the things I'm able to do, because there's certainly many places much worse off than we are. You know, what are my wishes for 2021? And I'll finish with a few of those. Uh, you know, death and suffering from COVID-19 to end is, a, is an incredible wish. And I hope we can get there this year. Uh, remaining all safe and healthy is really, really important uh, and not to let our guard down that this pandemic is still around us and, and it's hard to follow these rules, but we got to keep at it as much as we can uh, and encourage your family to do so. And this is going to be particularly hard during the holidays. Um, I think the NBHC needs to continue to promote innovation. We're even during this pandemic, we're able to and we're pushing and we're trying to treat and help our patients as best as we can. Um, I think a hybrid room is my dream uh, for me and, and hopefully we can achieve that because we're really hurting in terms of ability to expand what our, what our capacity is for, for dealing with a backlog in, in cardiac surgical care, certainly. And obviously the staff that, that is needed to achieve that. Uh, and finally, go on a vacation away from everything is really what I want. And this is a great photo from, from myself and my family. This is my wife there and my three sons walking ahead. This is a path on the way to Mont Blanc. You can see the, the snow peaks over there. Uh, you know, this is the kind of vacation I want to be. I want no internet. I want to be away from everything. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the day I can do that again. Um, and I thought I'd leave you with just a little, uh, I love this little photo. It's a, it's, a, it's a little clip of a typical German a tower celebrating the fourth advent. 
and obviously the light from the candles sort of allows the burning. Uh, and these little things are done by a handcrafted in Germany. Uh, and they were sort of a way to help people survive the winter many years ago uh, because there's no jobs in winter. And then it became an industry and people make these things and these toys and these these things. And it's a huge uh, money making endeavor in all the Christmas market, obviously, in Germany. Anyways, this is it for my talk today. Hopefully it's a good mixture of a bit of the science and a lot of uh, a little bit more lighthearted in many ways. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks, JS. That was fantastic. Great overview and uh, great review of, uh, of a unique year and hopefully one we'll never have to experience again. Uh, I guess, um, you know, not that this is a talk that sort of begs for a big Q&A, but I guess my, my, my two questions for you, just in your thoughts uh, before we sign off and wish everyone a happy new year and a merry, merry Christmas. Number one is um, just what was your sense as to the negative impact? I mean, obviously we were able to catch up and get a lot of those cases back that we had lost during the pandemic. What was your sense of the impact that this pandemic had on, on our patients, just in terms of the delay to care, you know, some people getting potentially more symptomatic on, on the wait list and, and the fact that we've been kind of into a, we're always playing catch up, but I feel like we've been playing acute on chronic catch up. Yeah, I, I mean, I have no way to prove this, but I, I do get a sense a little bit that I, I do think that patients have not necessarily seeked medical attention when needed and have waited for things. I think it will be a little more evident as we look at excess mortality, for example, or excess morbidity in the province and elsewhere in Canada, for example. Maybe we were not as affected as other provinces were, but I certainly get the sense that you see patients maybe a little later, maybe a little further down the line that you might not have um, while we've ad advanced, for example, a lot on virtual care aspect, I do worry that not seeing patients in person, there is some loss to some of the things you might pick up that you wouldn't have otherwise. And that's something important uh, that we need to adjust. Not that virtual care is not good. It's very good, but it's not for everything. And so those are the two important perspectives I think we should have. And I hope we can rectify a little bit in the coming year. Yeah, and there's a, quite a few people on the call. I can tell from the chat session here who they are to some extent, but I mean, I mean, they've probably had to shift a lot of their care to virtual and I think they would attest to that there are some strengths to this, but there's also potentially some weaknesses as well. And the other question I had for you is, uh, you know, as we kind of move into 2021 and obviously, you know, we're rolling out a pandemic, we're rolling out a, a vaccine, which is clearly encouraging for a lot of people and, and exciting, but at the same time, we're in the throes of uh, we're really in the throes of uh, of a second wave that's un that's unlike even the first and, and potentially even worse, not necessarily in Atlantic Canada, but across the world. Um, how do you find the balance, uh, you know, in terms of trying to advocate for more resources for cardiac disease, but at the same time being cognizant of the fact that, you know, we are still fighting uh, fighting an infection like no other? Yeah, it's incredibly hard. I mean, in retrospect, when we slowed down on the first wave, we probably jumped the gun way too fast because we were able to demonstrate how we were able to ramp down very quickly. And that's really what we were doing that for, was to build capacity for the system for intensive care unit need and all of that. Um, I think from a cardiac surgical point of view, we could have potentially helped a few more patients during that period of time, but we're not able to. Uh, so how do you balance those needs and balance those things? I mean, clearly the population health is, is as a whole for the province is important. So you need to maintain capacity, but we know we can wrap up and down very easily to build capacity when needed. So in the absence of the huge need in the hospital from a hospital resource point of view uh, to be ready for the pandemic, I think we still need to offer the care to as many of our patients as possible because they're terrified waiting at home. They're at risk waiting at home. And I think they're isolating themselves already. I think we need to pursue that as much as we can. And, and I, th I think it's tempting to say, well, we shut down everything, slow down everything. I'm not sure that's possible uh, because they are gonna die of their disease and the mortality rate for many of the things we do is actually higher than that of COVID. So, you know, how do you balance all those things? I don't know. And I don't know how to answer your resource question around government because clearly government is not interested necessarily in helping deal with the backlog and all the resources required for that because they're obviously just on the mindset of you know we got to deal with this pandemic then once we have that behind us we can focus on other things i understand but our job is to advocate for what we can 
So there, we're just one of the other people screaming, saying we need something. So if we screen loud enough, I think we can perhaps get a little bit more resources our way. Uh, it's always a, an imperfect system. So one of the questions that David uh, Buick asked was what, what resources are required for the, uh, for the hybrid room? And uh, so we've been kind of approaching government now for over a year, JF and I, and I'll let him speak to what it is that the hybrid room consists of. Um, and then I can speak a little bit to the foundation question. Yeah, I mean, the hybrid room is essentially a, an, an operating room where you would have the ability to do potentially interventional care, interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, other forms of surgery in ourselves. From a resource point of view for what we would need from cardiac surgery, even one day a week would add two cases per day in that room would mean 100 more cases a year, which would allow to deal with backlog, for example, relatively. So the resource need is obviously there, but there's ways to take from a few different places and reallocate, think a little bit outside the box on, on how you staff it. So there are ways potentially, but yes, it means more people to, to do that. We have the surgeon need for that. We may not have anesthesia. So there are some needs there that need to be done from a, an actual cost of doing that. It's, it's not huge amounts of money. It's, you know, in the range of three to $5 million, you'd likely be able to do that. I know it sounds like a big chunk of money, but it's not a, an insane investment. And we have the physical space actually to do it. Yeah, and that's exactly it. I think, you know, it would require some renovation, obviously. It's, uh, it, it would be akin to putting in a, a new cath lab or a new interventional radiology suite. Uh, the, the cost is predominantly on renovation and imaging chain. Those are the two biggest costs, and that's what's probably pushing this closer to five million. Uh, and obviously, as JF alluded to, there's the human resource element that really needs you needs to be there in order to be able to staff this thing. Um, so five million. I mean, the foundation has kind of just to, so that people know the foundation is aware of this idea, but they'd rather they they want to move away from bricks and mortar uh, for this go around um, because of the amount of time and investment that they've put into bricks and mortar for Clinic One. And really do, they really feel that this is a government, you know, this should be a government driven project. So that's, that's the answer to your question, uh, David. Uh, to, um, to Sharif's question, which I think is a, a good one, is, and I can maybe add to that question a little bit. So he's spoke a little bit to the perceived shorter wait times uh, for TAVI and whether or not there's some consideration to kind of changing more of our AVRs to TAVIs as opposed to leaving them as surgical AVRs. With longer wait times and then i will add to that a little bit of just overall wait list management during the pandemic and how we've incorporated a little bit the ischemia trial and and so maybe i'll let you answer that jf yeah the tavi question is an interesting one i um we've doubled the tavi volume in the last two years from 60 or so a year to over 120 this year and it's a continuing growth but we should be careful to make sure that that growth doesn't go against what we would think would be a survival advantage of. There are still patients, young patients, where TAVI is not appropriate. So right now, we are evaluating all patients for TAVI versus SAVR and most over the age of 70. Under the age of 70, you have to have pretty bad comorbidities or issues to really warrant that because there are going to be some survival loss or survival disadvantage potentially with long-term access to coronaries, reoperative interventions, and all those things. And some of the data coming out on long term would, would reinforce that aspect on the TAVI side. So, again, it's making those choices, thinking who's safe to wait. Our event rate on the wait lists are not very high, thank God, but they are always worrisome uh, to watch. Um, yeah, it is, it is a constant battle, but we are pushing as hard as we can to, to offer that as best we can. And then as far as the ischemia trial and how we're using that to maybe reevaluate some of our, especially our long waiters. Yeah, the ischemia trial has, has been helpful in my mind, not necessarily for, for not offering uh, intervention for patient, but it makes you feel that in stable ischemic heart disease patient, there's certainly a period of time where you may actually be in a safe period to reevaluate. So we've actually in the process of reevaluating again, all our patients that are waiting on a wait list, some of which were initially just started on medical therapy now a few months, for example, waiting and they've gotten better in which you, you sort of reevaluate what is the surgical or the survival advantage of intervention versus not. Are they truly ischemia patients? Are they not? So that aspect is certainly part of a discussion every day. Uh, but the reality is 60% of what we see is acute, acute coronary syndrome, acute patients come in a hospital. That doesn't change one bit. So 60% of the volume on average is not impacted at all by any of this. We're talking about a 
a much smaller uh, portion of this, maybe 30, 40% that are potentially out of, outpatient type, many of which have you know, left main disease and other things which are not ischemia type patients. So this really doesn't, it's, it's a small fraction, but it is an important fraction. And then just the last question, uh, uh, Susan Morris asked a little bit about research that is being done around the impact of COVID on, uh, on wait times, et cetera. And I know that, you know, we're uh, in the process of trying to construct a dashboard to that effect. And I just, maybe you could add a few thoughts to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, well, one is many of the projects are currently on the way. So I don't have any real data to, to tell you at the moment. And the, there's national efforts, there's provincial efforts, and NASAR has been sitting on national committees to try to address some of the issues of the impact of COVID on cardiac care and overall in Canada. Um, and we're trying to set up a, a, a much more functional dashboard here in which we would have you know, in real time data on patients currently waiting uh, potentially even uh, for surgeons to be able to tell, you know, how am I comparing to my colleague, that kind of stuff, and the type of patient, which regions are waiting longer. So there's a lot of functionality that we're trying to use this current crisis, obviously, as a, as a again, to galvanize our thoughts around, you know, making this in real time and make decisions around that. Uh, having said that, the wait time, as you know, is a complicated story because it doesn't mean if you wait longer, you're more likely you're going to be the one having an event our problem is always trying to figure out who's going to have an event and how do we prevent that event. Yeah. So, and that's where we're not perfect at. And this is where our regular follow-up getting our inter our colleagues in cardiology and family medicine also to reevaluate these patients. There are patients that can be stable for months without issues. Others can't be stable for weeks and, and have issues. So it's, it's really figuring out who needs this more urgently versus less urgently. This is where our research really needs to focus on, I think. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And I think it was a great way to end the year. Thank you so much for everyone's uh, enthusiasm around these rounds. And I look forward to kind of getting started back up on the 13th of January with a new set. Uh, in the meantime, uh, from all of us to all of you and your families, uh, Merry, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.